Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Courtside with Beelins and Tennis, part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I am so fired up tonight because not only do I have my co-host and Hall of Famer Steve Flink back with me on tonight, but we are also joined by one of our favorite commentators, also a Hall of Famer. It is an absolute privilege for me to have this guest with us on tonight. Please welcome to the pod, Mary Carrillo. Mary, this is a privilege. Thank uh, you so uh, much. Hey, I'm, I'm very happy to be here with you too. So, uh, you know, it's been, I don't know, what are we going on? 13 months of all this craziness with the pandemic. We're starting to come out of it. The vaccines are out. You, your family, I know you have parents that are, are still doing well. Everyone doing okay with all this? I've been very lucky. I really have. My parents are good. My son is good. My daughter last year gave me a pandemic granddaughter. Uh, baby Raya now is 14 months old and she's magnificent and brilliant. Uh, greatest baby of all time. So I will remember 2020 a lot differently from uh, a lot of my friends and colleagues, that's for sure. For me, uh, it was a blessing to become a grandmother. Well, congratulations. Thank and we're going to get into all the great commentating stuff uh, uh, later, but not everybody knows um, that you yourself are actually a Grand Slam champion. <laughs> and we'll go back 1977 with a guy you grew up with, decent tennis player himself, yes, Donnie Mack. What was it like carrying him to, to the French <laughs> Open mixed doubles title? It was a lot of luggage. I, I just, I, I just, it's all coming back to me. Uh, um, you know what? It was a, a it was a great time uh, because uh, John was only 18 years old. He was there to play junior French, and uh, I was a rookie pro. And we signed up at a time in 1977. A lot of a lot of the best players weren't there. To tell you the truth, they were playing world team tennis, which meant they weren't allowed to play at Roland Garros. So we got into the mix. And I mean, we'd been playing and uh, together and growing up together and arguing for our almost our entire lives. So, <laughs> but the, the hell of it is, he was he is a a magnificent player. He was when he was eighteen. He just got it. And people don't think he's maybe a great clay court player because he never won the singles at Roland Garros. But we grew up on clay. There are three clay courts at the Douglasson Club and two hard courts. And I mean, John. John could play on anything. So yes, it was the, it was, it was a, um, it's a longstanding joke on my side that it was um, John McEnroe's first ever Grand Slam title and, and my last. Yes. Uh, no, <laughs> that's, that's just how that went. But I, I, I wonder, Steve Flink, when you first laid eyes on John McEnroe, was it a couple of weeks later at Wimbledon 77? It was absolutely. I saw him make that great run to the semis and take a set of a Connors, and it's pretty astounding. But Mary, before we get away from you here, I th a lot of the a lot of the listeners probably don't realize this was a great lefty combination because yeah. you were a left-hander, and I don't. I, most of your fans know you as a broadcaster, and many of them never saw you play. So that talk about that component of, of, of you and John as two lefties and how you decided who was going to be in the deuce court or the ad court and how confounding that might have been for your opponents. Um, well, John was confounding to our opponents. <laughs> and the whole point, Steve, that are basically right from the start of the fortnight, the plan was John was going to take everything possible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, in my defense, I actually had pretty good hands at the net. So I was, I was pretty good up there. Um, but that's about it. I mean, John pretty much, I was really choking in the last couple of rounds when it became, when we became aware of the fact that we might actually win the thing, I was getting very tight and, uh, and John wasn't, uh, John, you know, just, he genuinely, honestly, when we signed up for the mix, he looked at the draw, he looked at the, I'm, I'm sorry, he looked at the players, the teams and said, well, we should win this thing. <laughs> and like, what the hell are you talking about? What do you mean? We're going to win this thing. It was the first major for either one of us. And John had it in his head that, that we can win it. But I, I mean, I, I really wasn't that good. I could not have played in the 80s or 90s or certainly now with my game. Because I was a lefty, but I wasn't, a, I didn't have a real lefty serve. You know what I mean? I didn't have a, I wasn't the kind of lefty John was. I was more like the you know, some, some people are leftier than others. You know, Martina was a lefty. John was a lefty. Vilas, yeah. I think. I don't think Jimmy Connors was a lefty. When you think of Jimmy, 
do you think, oh God, that guy was a real lefty? I don't think of him that way, do you? No, not at all. Not, not at, all, at all, right? Not at all. But you, you know, Mary, only a few weeks later, you brought up about when I first saw John play. It was also when I first saw you play because you came to Wimbledon and you took Kerry Melville Reed, the number eight seed, to seven five in the third. Could have and changed history. If you'd won that <laughs> match, you might have broadcast. That's but right. Was... That, Mary, you know what I remember about that? The exuberance. You yes. had so much fun out there. And I did. You, I couldn't believe I was there. <laughs> We're somebody who emoted not in anger but in joy. Would you agree with that? Yeah. No, I was thrilled to be there. You know, I it's it's funny when when I was growing up, you know, I, I was attending with John and Vita Scarolitis and his sister Ruda, who was my best friend. We were attending the Port Washington Tennis Academy, which was a, a tremendous place. I mean, normally if you wanted to take tennis seriously as a junior in the US when I was growing up, you had to be on the clay courts of Florida or the hard courts of California. Te actually, Texas was a pretty was a pretty great tennis state back when I was a kid. So the fact that New York all of a sudden had this magnificent academy with these great teaching pros was was something special. I mean, so I was lucky to to be around that kind of an atmosphere and and be around all that good training. Um, you and know what? Was, you're you're a Grand Slam champion. Not many people can say that. So well, you're yeah, selling but yourself I, short. With I'm you. not, David, because honestly, my when there was a, the the famous uh, Wimbledon boycott of 1973, a lot of the top male players didn't play. So Vitas Garolitis got in. This guy I've known, you know, my whole my whole junior career, a, a friend of mine is playing at Wimbledon, and I that blew my mind, and that became my goal as boy. If I could just make it to Wimbledon, I never had any aspirations to go deep at Wimbledon or win it. So that 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 match that Steve is talking about in '77 against Carrie Melville Reed, who was a seed, and she was a good grass court player. You know, what? she had she had a she had a very good net game, and she, her ground game got her in. She had nice tight volleys. Um, it was a thrill to honestly, it was a thrill to be there, and I played there two more times, and. Uh, I never got that far. I once we, the year '77 when John got to the semis as a qualifier, um, he and I we had won the French and now we're playing the mix at Wimbledon because what the hell, right? And John had it in and said we could win that one too. <laughs> <laughs> we, <laughs> John got to the semis, loses in four to Connors, and then he had we had to play our mixed doubles match. Do you think John McEnroe felt like playing a mixed doubles mm -hmm. match? Uh, and our buddy Vitas Garolais was playing Bjorn Borg on center court. And so we were missing that match. We were over on court two. We were playing Dennis Ralston and Martina Navratilova. And we went 10, we lost 10 8 in the third to them, listening to Vitas playing five against Bjorn. So anyway, during that summer, so after Wimbledon, all right, we lose in the quarters of Wimby. Nice little run. And then over the summer, we're hanging out, we're arguing, we're. <laughs> <laughs> we, we play the U.S. Open, lose first round, and that was it. <laughs> and, I, and John basically claimed my mixed doubles career is over. But then I think the next year he played with his then girlfriend, Stacey Margolin, and they lost early. So then he said, "That forget it, that's it. But at Wimbledon, he signed up to play with Steffi Groff. Do you remember this, Steve? Oh, very well, because that was <laughs> the year when he went in the Hall of Fame that year. That is absolutely correct. So here, so David, not, let me let me tell, Mary, tell the story, Mary, about uh, that, that. John was not very happy with Steffi. Right, I remember that. I remember. you remember this too. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you what I remember about it, guys. John signs up to play mix with Steffi Groff, right? And Steffi had been carrying like an injury or two, whatever. Anyway, Martina and I, Martina Navratilova and I, saw John. And, and said, you son, you're, you're playing mix with Groff? And John said, yeah, man, it's gonna be great. And I said, you know, if she goes deep in the single, she's gonna bail. Yep. No freaking way she would do that to me. And Martin, God damn it, that, that could easily, you know, Martino agreed with me. <laughs> sure enough, <laughs> sure enough, they go deep. Steffi's, I think it was her leg that was bugging or whatever, John, yeah, and I'm John and I are working together at NBC. He comes off of a he comes off of a a senior match or whatever. He comes in, and he hasn't heard yet that Steffi oh. has yanked. And this sounds terrible, but I wanted to be around when John found out. <laughs> but, 
because I had called it, you know, um, and boy, he was upset because they had gotten to the semis of the mix and they were a huge hit. I mean, Steffi was enjoying herself and she was listening to John and John was totally digging it. And you know how big a story and a, and a, I mean, England loves watching John McEnroe. They were like watching him talk, walk, play. They were playing great. They could have won the mixed double title, but as it stands now, the only major he's ever won in mixes is with you know who. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> no, I just still um, remember, Mary, I still remember him talking about it in Newport. He was still- He, he was, was still aggravated. In his system, yeah, he was still aggravated, right? Yeah, well, he could have won. I mean, he could yeah. look. Peter, 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 uh, <clears throat> his longtime Dutch partner, Peter Fleming, had it right many, many years ago when he said John McEnroe and anybody yeah. is the yeah. best doubles team in the world. I mean, that's how that's, that's how talented he is. But I got to ask you one more question about John. The first time you saw him, Steve, could you tell, could you tell who he was going to be even then, even when he was 18? You know, I have to admit, I, I, I saw Becker at 15 and I was more convinced. Oh, we, interesting on the juniors and I it wasn't that I didn't think John was great but I wanted to see a little more yeah I I just wanted a, a an, another major or two and uh, by the by it, it didn't take me long to, to come around and by 79 I was I was convinced uh but no I I just thought it was a great run and he was going to be a great player but if, if I wasn't ready to give him all those majors yet I wasn't ready to make him world number one I just thought the potential was there well soon after I know, I know you guys probably know this, but soon after he played Davis Cup and they played against England out in California in the final and Rod Laver was there because Rod was already living there and he was there to watch this thing. And I'll never forget that somebody was comparing McEnroe to Laver, the leftiness and the cleverness and all that stuff. And Rod Laver, who John and I grew up idolizing, this is the greatest player of all time. Rod Laver said, it's an honor to be compared to him. Ron yeah. Laver said that about John, David, about John. Yeah. That, that was music to his ears, and why wouldn't yes, it? Yes, absolutely yeah. right. Un unbelievable. So, yeah. I mean, you, you grew up with Johnny Mac. You saw Jimmy and Bjorn, right? I grew up, we all saw, I grew up with what is really the greatest generation of American tennis with Andre and Jim, Michael and Pete, by the way, Steve's most recent project, Pete Sanford's Greatness Revisited. Awesome. Great book. book. Great Please book. Go get it. Great, great book. Um, you know, after Pete won his 14th slam, maybe sometime in the future, someone would could break that record. Now, who in their right mind would think not one, not two, but, you know, three guys in the same generation absolutely blow that record away. I mean, no one saw that. You saw Roger just starting as Pete was kind of, you know, yeah. as Pete was retiring. Rafa and Novak really weren't there yet. Um, it's just crazy that that 14 slams looks like uh, junior varsity compared to the <laughs> guys. <laughs> well, I don't think Pete saw, I think Pete thought that there was a real mic drop moment when he won the US Open for his final major and walked away. How many people walk away like that, right? Um, it's astonishing what we've been living through. It's astonishing that these three players in modern, in our time, are so great and have divvied up the majors so closely together. I mean, that's that's the remarkable thing for me is that they just keep they just keep cranking. I'd, I'd be a little surprised. I don't know how you guys feel if Roger can pull off another major. I think if he stays at twenty, that's amazing and remarkable. And I don't think Pete or any of us saw that coming. But I got to think that that both Rafa and Novak are going to pass that. But yeah, I, I agree with you, David. I thought that Pete, what Pete, how I loved how he played anyway. I love how he comported himself. Um, I thought that was gonna, I thought that was gonna be a pretty safe number for a long time. For a while. Uh, you know, for it's funny, while. Steve and I, Steve, Steve and I have talked about this. If you look at any industry, sports, outside of sports, any industry you pick, the fourth, fifth, and sixth best person is pretty damn good, right? Right. And right. for a long time in tennis, these big, the big three, Rafa, Roger, and Novak, there was such a wide disparity. Yeah. Right now, the, the fourth, fifth, and sixth, they're coming up. They're they're getting closer. But for a while there, 
the fourth, fifth, and sixth, there was such a wide disparity from the top three guys. And that just, that shouldn't be. If you're fourth, fifth, and sixth, and whatever it is you do, that's pretty frigging good. <laughs> but at a time when uh, so many uh, journalists and fans only use the majors, you know, as, as, the, as the judging point, um, it's just been those those three guys have been clogging it up for a long time. Look, I'm surprised. What Vavrinka was 29 when he first won his first, Steve. I mean, that, yeah. I didn't see that coming, frankly. No, I didn't. Uh, but but Mary, not only that, did you also see it coming? That I mean, he he beats an admittedly injured Rafa to win the Australian, but still a big win. Yeah. Then he beats Novak the following year in 2015 in the French final, and then the year after that he beats Novak again in the U.S. Open final. Yeah. For, for Stan to beat those. Two wins over Novak in Grand Slam finals, one over Rafa. Who would have believed that? Right. And and that he's never lost a major final. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's three for three. Yeah. I don't the, think um the only thing I would I would compare it to as far as the disparity from the top of the top to the rest of the field is is Christian Martina back yeah. in the day, right? Yeah. I mean, they were getting to the semis and finals of every every slam. And they played so much. They really supported the tour. Uh yeah. and that that just doesn't happen anymore on either side, does it? You know, I mean, everyone has pulled way back and everyone concentrates on the majors. Everyone's entire season is designed around the majors. And Chrissy and Martina weren't doing that. They were, they were being asked to play. They played. They played against each other 80 times. I mean, I don't know. Those days are over. <laughs> those days are over. Yeah. Yeah. And then you got, you got a guy who uh, the dominance at Roland Garros is just absolutely ridiculous. Uh, Rafael Nadal's record is 100 wins and two losses. It's the fourth time he's won the French open without losing a set. Right. I mean, 21 right. sets to, to the good to yeah. zero sets lost. That's just absolutely ridiculous. 13 French opens. Um, you cover more than just tennis. Um, there are some crazy Olympic records. Mm -hmm. um, we, we went out on Twitter a while ago, Steve and I, we were asking for, uh, you know, is there anything quite comparable? I think Edwin Moses had a crazy yeah. um, record in track. There's Michael Phelps. Um, is there anything that, that can remotely compare to, to, to Rafa's dominance on clay? I don't think so. I'll say that right out front. I do also say, you know, as, Amazed as I was by teenage Rafa Nadal, I've, I was never more impressed with him than I was last fall when the French Open was played and he went, he went again without dropping a set. That to me was astounding. The guy hadn't played in months and you know, he, he, it, didn't, it didn't seem to matter. He beat Djokovic so quickly, so easily. And eight months after that, he gets to go for <laughs> another one. But I, I, you know, it's funny that it's hard to compare, you know, different times in this sport, but it's also like someone like Michael Phelps. And I've been lucky enough to cover, to be at the many Olympics that he's, where he's taken the gold. There are so many events that he played, you know, that he could swim in, you know what I mean? He can, he can swim in freestyle, he can, free in he can swim in the IM, he can swim in, you know, the, the relays. So there are more medals to be had by some athletes like Michael Phelps at an Olympics. Then there are for so many other Olympians, you know. Uh, so medal counts are, to me, that it's not necessarily the way to judge. But the, I, I don't know that anyone will ever think of, of someone mastering a surface in tennis the way Rafa has on clay. And I remember when he won his 12th. I was, I, was, I was working for NBC, and I was sitting next to John McEnroe. And I and John speaks so lovingly of Bjorn Borg. I mean, they they truly are friends and and admirers of one another. And I said, your guy Bjorn, he was thought of as the best clay court player of all time. Rafa's now won twice as many. <laughs> <laughs> Let's sit back and think about that. It's unbelievable. It's yeah. absolutely. The scary thing, Mary, is that I I just don't see how he doesn't win at least one of the next two and probably both. Yeah, my guess is he ends up with 15. I do too. I think that, and and I still think he can win himself another U.S. Open. You know, uh, he's it, that he's only won one Australian Open is that's that's kind of crazy to me. Um, yeah, it is. Something always seems to go wrong. Something always seems to happen. Australia. I mean, look at look what had happened here. He, 
it, one of those rare losses, one of three in his career from two sets to love up against yeah. Stefano Sisbitus in the uh, in the quarter. For who would have thought seen that one coming? And he was playing so well up until then. So, so you're let, right. Yeah. So let me ask you then, uh, speaking of CC Pons, I, I think I think Rafa gets another French Open for sure. So does CC Pots could his first major come at Wimbledon? His first major title? It's possible. Yeah, I mean, I certainly make him a strong contender there because of the way he attacks. His, yeah. his, he's, he, his transition game is so good and he volleys so well and he has a good game for grass. Yeah. yeah. Could, it, on the other hand, we've seen him in, this, in the semis of the Australian a couple of times and we saw him in the semis of Roland Garros last year. So he's the kind of guy that could strike almost anywhere. Yeah. I'm still liking Rafa at the French. Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Bold call. Bold call. <laughs> Um, listen, we talked about, you know, you playing with Johnny Mac, 1977. We talked about some current players right now. I want to go back to how you got to where you are today, because your story is not something that, uh, will be in any textbook and recommended by professors by this is the way you go about being the next Mary Carrillo. So if you would be so kind enough to share your unconventional journey, that would be, uh, that would be, uh, special. Uh, if you're talking about how I ended up talking about tennis on TV and yes. other sports, yeah, I did not go to college. Um, I did not study journalism. It's funny because it, back in the day, I, I would get letters from journalism students, communications majors, English majors at, at colleges, and they'd say, ah, I'm, I'm majoring in communication, I'm minoring in English, I work for the radio show, I have a, but tennis is my favorite sport. How do I get your job? And I'd say, all right. First win Wimbledon, then <laughs> <laughs> such a, a Weisenheimer response. I would call him on the phone and talk to him about it. I didn't, but yes, my, I was, I was very, very uh, fortunate. Um, as a player, I didn't win much, but uh, Virginia Slims and then Avon, the, the other title sponsor of women's tennis, they would bring me in after losses and I would explain how hilariously I had lost and why, and why the person who had just thrown me down on a flight of stairs beat me so easily and what was so good about them. And even when in my playing days, David, I was writing articles. Uh, there used to be a WTA newsletter that I would submit stuff to. And I, you know, I was doing that kind of stuff. I'd always enjoyed uh, writing. I'd always enjoyed, you know, but eh, it's not like I grew up thinking that, oh, and when I retire, I'm gonna be on TV. like. That never occurred to me. And there weren't that many women calling sports, frankly. Uh, I've been doing this now for more than 40 years. Uh, 40 years ago, if I was you know, working for USA Network or PBS or wherever the hell I was getting work, Madison Square, I was normally the only woman there, you know, more often than not. It was guys. It was just a bunch of guys. So that I was lucky enough that somebody once heard me one night call a match at Madison Square Garden just out of the stands, you know, and again, USA Network started calling, started covering women's tennis. From women's tennis, I went from men's tennis. From men's tennis, I went to other sports. It, yes, there's nothing textbook about about what I did. This is not a roadmap for <laughs> this is not a roadmap for anybody. And and also now these days, in, not just in tennis, but in so many sports, <clears throat> you have to be a champion. You know, you have to, or you have to have a big brand and I wasn't either. So um, I don't know. I don't know if somebody like me could could make their way through again. This was early days. And uh, and I, again, a, a lot of it was just the circumstances and the fact that I, I, I kept raising my hand. Yeah. Yeah. I think if I think the lesson to be learned in, in any in any industry is, you know, you never know when you might get an opportunity. And when you do get that opportunity, you know, be prepared and run for it because you never, never know if you'll get that opportunity again. And, you know, how, right. how, whatever the reason was that you got an opportunity, you took it, you took advantage of it. You're obviously extremely um, accomplished at what you do. And, and, and yeah, it may not be in a textbook, but again, the lesson is if you get an opportunity, go and do your very best work and run with it. And the other, I think the other lesson, or at least the one I, I espouse, I believe in is, uh, especially for women, you know, who, who want to get into this kind of business and want to do this kind of work. You've got to send the elevator back down. You know, you've got to, you've got to make it so that 
other women have a chance. There's more diversity. You know, there's more gender equity. Yeah, you, know, you know, you want them to. I, I, I genuinely believe that women sportscasters and women sports writers, they look out for each other and they mentor each other and they want, they want to change the chemistry of a room. They want more. You know, Billie Jean King used to always say that to me. You know, you have to be in the room. You have to. That's how. That's how things change. You know. Um, she also said something really smart to me. I, I think I was still playing. I think I had just, I think I just lost a, a match. And, and Billy, uh, she's known for a lot of different sayings, but the one that I've always held close to is when she said, I, I had lost a match and she said, it's not failure, it's feedback. How cool is that? Yeah. How cool is that, Steve? That's a terrific line. Yeah. Great isn't line. that nice? I wish it were more popular because I, I tell that, my kids grew up listening to me say that, and the, I say that all the time. You know, get okay. What did, what did we learn here? What are we walking off this court knowing? What are we walking out of this booth knowing about ourselves? Right. Well, and, there's the saying: you either you either win or you learn. Right? You never guess, lose. You either win. The, or, I don't know. Similar. I lost a lot when I <laughs> when <laughs> I think back on my pointy-headed career. I really remember a lot of losses. <laughs> but, but I I just I love the the sensibility of that. Don't you? Yeah, I do. Well, I'm Mary, was there a turning point? You look back on, at some point in the 80s where you reached a certain level of comfort that this is where I belong and this is going to work out and I know where I'm headed here. Or did you never have that feeling? I, I don't. You mean in the booth, like like covering booth. sports? Um, booth. I think I was always kind of, frankly, kind of comfortable in the booth. Um, and I, I was lucky. I don't remember. I don't know how much you remember that you and I were in the booth with Bud Collins for a oh, couple of years. Well, Madison yeah. Square Garden Network. I mean, I Bud made it easy for us, didn't he? He sure did. And I have to tell you a quick story, David. One one night we we I threw in some kind of a funny stat in the middle of the broadcast, <laughs> and, and, which I love doing. Something a little obscure. And Mary turned to me and she said, "I've heard you say a lot of demented things. That's the most demented of all." <laughs> So you and kept I, both. And I stand by it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, it was, yeah. It, a lot, that was a great joy for me, uh, being with you and Bud in the booth. It was a lot of fun to calling that those championships in the garden. Couldn't have been more fun. I And and it was, again, you know, Bud was doing, Bud was a play-by-play -play guy. So Bud was doing all the carpentry, getting us on and off the air, in and out of commercials. He had big energy, big enthusiasm. Yeah. So obviously you want to stay up to that. And here you were so knowing, so aware of the moment and the numbers. And so, so I was just, I was in the middle of this sandwich thinking, this is, this is uh, how it should be. And I've, <laughs> over the years, I've gotten to work with a lot of people that make me more comfortable. But I, th I don't know that I was ever that nervous because my, I, uh, up in the booth, if, if you feel like you've done your homework, you know, you know your stuff, and you feel prepared and you're sitting next to somebody that you like or admire or you know respect i don't know it just it just feels comfortable S switching going on to other sports i mean there was a a level of comfort i had to earn big time you know just so i felt like i belonged for those kind of things but i i don't know i just i i know you you both know i come from a long line of storytellers in the carrillo family and uh <laughs> We all like spinning a tail, you know? So I think I, I, you kind of feel like if you're sitting around the table full of Carrillo's, you kind of feel like you got to hold up your end of the conversation, you know? And <laughs> your, mother, your, mother, your mother was probably the champion uh, uh, I, in the, right? Steve, the last time you spoke to my mother, she's still on that same sentence. <laughs> she's, she's, and another thing, Steve, <laughs> you, you, you haven't seen her for 20 years. It doesn't matter. Yes. David, you talk, you talk about a proud parent, David. I, I, I mean, when, when I used to hang around Mary's mother in the garden in different places when Mary was working, she, she didn't brag, but she was so proud. And That's great. She got a kick out of it. Probably yeah, not. Any parent, as any parent should be. That's so, so great. She um, did. I want to just throw out a couple things, and I'll ask both of you these questions. And just kind of first things that come to your mind um, about a few topics, um, some current, some not so current. I'm just eager, you know, with both of you on this right now, I just really eager to hear your thoughts on this. So 
with that, I'm just going to throw out there. We'll start with Steve. Um, Fed and Serena, to either to either win another slam. It's funny because Mary was alluding to it a little bit earlier with Federer. Uh, I, I think it's slim. I think really what it comes down to for Federer, in my mind, is a one last serious bid at Wimbledon this year. He's going to turn 40 later in the summer. He has the memories of the two match points against Novak in the 2019 final, coming back to a place he's always loved. And yeah. If it's going to happen, I think it happens there or, or else probably nowhere. So I think his chances are somewhat slim, but maybe he pulls it off there under the right circumstances with Novak losing to somebody else. I think he needs a few breaks there. Mm -hmm. So odds against, but I don't rule it out. Serena, I give a slightly better chance because you look at her recent run in the majors and the four finals in 2018, yeah. 2019 at Wimbledon and the Open combined. Mm -hmm. Then these last two majors, the semis of the Open, the semis of the Australian, she's in the thick of things, I uh, it's still I still say odds slightly against, but I give her a better chance than Roger. What about you, Mary? Um, I think Roger has a chance to win the Olympics this year because it's hard courts, two out of three sets. He's going to yeah. be huge in Japan because he's yeah. got that Japanese clothing contract. There are going right. to be posters of Roger and Naomi Osaka. I get to go to Tokyo. I get to cover my what will be my 15th Olympics. Wow. I think they're both going to be... I, I'm, I'm so glad that I'll be there because it'll probably be the last Olympics for a bunch of them, for Rafa and Roger, Serena, Venus, if she gets into the dubs. I mean, it's going to be a big sporting event. So I think I, I, I would agree with Steve that Serena might have a better chance. But again, they, they both have played so little for so long. Right. And that's, right. A, that's an issue. And I, and I think what it comes down to when you see Roger playing well, when you see Serena playing well, and then the obverse of that, it's if you let either one of them, yeah, it, if you let them hit three shots, they're in, you know, they're in the mix. If you make them hit three shots, maybe you got a chance to get them. You know, there's a, I think that's a very fine and important distinction. If they come out on the court playing their points on their terms, you know, dictating yeah. early. Then I think they both they both have a shot, but I I would agree that Serena's got a slightly better chance of getting to 24 than Roger does at 21. Right, right. I well, wouldn't uh, mind seeing either one, by the way, guys. Oh yeah, yeah. I wouldn't mind seeing either one. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I'll stay with you, Mary. Uh, first thing that comes to mind, Coco Golf. <laughs> very, very talented. Very, very talented. Um, yeah. With that, I mean, she uh, she announced herself, declared herself so early and so uh, importantly at Wimbledon a couple of years ago, getting to the fourth round, beating Venus on the way. Sure, surely there are parts of her game that she needs to to shore up, but she's a kid. She's a kid. I hope she doesn't. Uh, I hope she doesn't fall under the weight of extreme pressure. Too many sponsors. Too many a agents yanking her around too, too many places. I don't think so. She seems very pulled together. And I think all agents and parents have learned the lessons of, of past tragedies in women's tennis, right? Uh, uh, Jennifer Capriati springs to mind. I mean, that kid was so good, so young. She was so hungry, full of ambition. But she was like by the second year on the tour, she had traveled too much. She had played too many exos. She was... <laughs> You know, she had a, you know, this is a, she's 14 years old and she's got a, an oil of Olay contract, you know, at a time when all skin breaks out, you know, she's, <laughs> she's, she's got, she's got that kind of stuff to worry about. And I think Coco, I, a huge, huge upside and very blue skies for that kid. I also like how, how willing she is to be an activist at such yeah. a young age. I mean, Coco stepped up last summer, Black Lives Matter. Naomi Osaka stepped up, Serena and Venus, you know, and again, I know, you know we've heard them talk about their religion and Jehovah's Witnesses. They don't get political and all that, but boy, those two, those two young ladies really stepped up in, in important ways. And I was very admiring of that. Yeah. Steve, how big, how blue are the skies for Coco? Well, I, I, I keep thinking two or three years when, I mean, th th you alluded to it, but I mean, having been in the 16s of Wimbledon, having beaten Naomi uh, in the Australian Open a year ago, she's had some good experiences already. 
36 yep. in the world already at 17. I see her really coming to the forefront at 20 and 21. I mean, I think she'll get a lot better this year, top 20 end of the year, maybe break into the top 10 next year. But then I think as we're really looking at, say, two, three years from now, I, I, I see her starting down the road of winning some majors. I just think she has that mentality. And I think yeah. but now and then, Mary, maybe shore up the forehand a little bit. It tends to get go awry right now at times. And the serve. And the serve. Yeah. The double faults, exactly. But I think yeah. that's going to change. And uh, and I, I see her really making a, a move at 2021 that's going to be exhilarating for a lot of fans. I, I, I use an expression, guys. Uh, maybe you've heard it because I... I, I there are some players that just, they have fangs, you know? <laughs> and there are some players who don't. <laughs> and and I, I don't think you can grow them if you don't already have them. I don't think you can teach fangs. But I got it in my head that, that Coco Goff has fangs. Steve, yeah. I'll, I'll start uh, this one with you, and then we'll go to Mary. Um, sure. Favorite tournament to cover? Steve, obviously, as a writer, and Mary, as a commentator. Steve, why don't you start out on this one? Uh, I've, it's, it's always been Wimbledon for me, maybe because I fell in love with it as a 12-year-old, about to turn 13, going out there in 1965 as a fan, and then of, having not missed it since 77, covering it. And I, I just feel like the eyes of the world are on it. There's just... They, you, you, you can't do justice to it with words, but it, it is so meticulously run. Yes. And the pageantry, the whole experience to me exceeds any other major. So that one is an easy choice for me, Wimbledon. Yeah, that's a pretty good choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty, and, and there are events that whose physical, the, the physicality of it, like Wimbledon, when you're there, it feels different from any, any other tournament. Uh, the Masters in golf, uh, the Kentucky Derby. There are some places that are made even more special because of the actual physical space where something is held. So I happen to love Wimbledon uh, because on and off, well, pretty much for the last 20 years, I have been staying, uh, I rent a flat at Wimbledon every year with Billie Jean King and her partner, Alana Klotz. So those two weeks spent with those two, uh, is just one of the best. It, I, I look forward to it every year. And Billy was on a run there uh, until the pandemic last year. She had missed, she had not missed Wimbledon since she was a 17 year old and played it there for the first time. Well, Barry, my guess, my guess is there's a lot of conversation and very little sleep over that. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Alana, Steve, you're so right. She, <laughs> she sees us, we wind each other up and and Billy's like she's flailing her arms and she's and and, and, and yes there is a it gets it is the best kind of exhaustion you can have is uh, rooming at Wimbledon with Billy and Alana. I also Amazing. think Indian Wells is a remarkable event, and and the major I've really come to love is Melbourne, um, just because it's ten minutes. You, it's a ten minute walk from the middle of Melbourne right. down to right. the courts. It's so civilized, right? And it's relaxed, and the players are coming into the sun. A lot of them have been spending winter somewhere, and they're they're coming off their training block, and they're kind of happy to see the press, you know. Until we start asking stupid questions, <laughs> I that <laughs> Melbourne has become a huge favorite of mine. Yeah, I love it as well. I do. That would come second to Wimbledon for me, yeah. but it is thoroughly relaxed, and yeah. despite the magnitude of the event, it's. It does that does set it apart from all the other majors. Absolutely. Will I'll start with Mary with this one. Will Novak at the end of the day be the one with the most with the most slams? Yes. That's Steve? it. <laughs> yes. Steve? Yes. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. It's funny. I just wrote a piece about this a, a couple of weeks ago and I, I tried to map it out. And I see Rafa <laughs> winning two more French, as I was saying earlier. I see and but I honestly don't think despite Mary's valid point that Rafa could win another Australian or could win another U.S. Open. I'm not convinced it's going to happen. I see the two more French is very likely. But Novak, I mean, he, he I, I think he's going to win at least a, one or two more Wimbledons. He's he's never done himself justice. Three U.S. Opens for Djokovic, considering his hardcore prowess, makes yeah. no sense. Lost five finals there. He's due for, you know, so I just, and then Australia, where he's, nine and oh in the finals so i you, you know he could win anywhere and even roland garros especially if rafa mm. got hurt or lost to somebody else novak oh. is 
is a great play court player in his own right. So in the end, I think he will nose by Nadal, maybe by one or two majors, but he'll have the most when all is said and done. I agree with Mary on that. To, to also, add to that point, Mary, Steve and I talked about this previously. Novak um, missed out one that was in his control and one was not in his control. Novak could have two more at this point because Wimbledon didn't happen in 2020. And we all know what happened in the U.S. Open. If that doesn't happen, there's no reason to think that he would not have won the 2020 U.S. Open. So to say that he's still going to have the most with an opportunity of not having the two that I just referred to is pretty incredible. I also think. David and Steve, that it means more to Novak than the other two guys. I genuinely feel that way. When Rafa says he's, he doesn't, he, that's the major count is not necessarily on his mind. I believe him. I, I think Rafa is, I've grown to appreciate and respect his words as much as his tennis these days. Cause I, I think he has a very good sensibility, a very balanced look at the whole world. Uh, and Roger, of course, is older than these two guys. So I don't think he has the same chance as Novak. We have all seen the, not only how magnificent a player he is, but the defiance that gives him so much fuel. I think it will be at a time when he's playing against two guys who are, who are beloved, and he is not necessarily that in a lot of people's minds. I really happen to like the guy myself. Um, I think that he ends up on top of everybody in the history of tennis means more to him and will propel him more than, than I think it, it, it will Rafa or Roger. Yeah. Do you, do you sense that about him or no? No, definitely, definitely. The defiance is the right word. But I also, Mary, I think it's funny. We've talked about him before. I think you and I see Djokovic in a very similar light. And I, I also like him. I also yeah. think, and I interviewed him for the Sampras book and he could not have been more accommodating or generous in the way he spoke. And I, I, I've always felt a certain sorrow that he, he has to be compared to two giants yes. uh, in the public mind, like Rafa mm -hmm. and Roger, never mind the achievers, but just those people, the two of them being so immensely popular. It's been hard on Djokovic. Yes. He, deserves he deserves better in my mind. But as far as his targeting the record, I agree. It's more of a singular obsession to him, just like the weeks at number one. Yeah. Breaking Rogers weeks at number one. And I think then he'll also start going after the trying to get the seven years when we get later to the, the later into this campaign, he'll want to finish the year up number one. So it could be, it, he's definitely, uh, the goals are very targeted. Absolutely. Right. He also speaks better English than any other tennis player, man or woman. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm including Americans and Brits. <laughs> he articulates himself so well. And a, a quick question from you, Steve. You pick out one thing that Novak said about Pete for your book, one thing that meant the most to you, spoke the loudest to what Novak thinks about Sampras. Oh, I think it was just the way he, his reverence for, for watching. I just loved him reflecting on the, watching Pete win Wimbledon in 93 and Novak is six years old. Yeah, and I, I love that story. And the other story I love was his father deliberately rooting for Agassi and Courier to see sort of goading Novak. <laughs> no favorite and Novak standing by Pete, but no, it wasn't so sort of one comment. It was the range of comments and no. the and genuine, the genuine uh, respect that he had for Sampras. I, yes. I, I love that. I did too. Because oddly, I think they're, they're, they're more similar than many people may realize. Wow. Different, different dispositions, totally yes. different dispositions and temperaments, but there are, there are other similarities in the way they, they look at things. In terms of ambition, you mean? Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah. All right, last two. Uh, we kind of referred to them a little bit, but uh, again, I'll just throw it out there and you, you say first thing that comes to mind. We'll start with Steve with this one, Chrissy and Martina. <laughs> well, the greatest rivalry in the history of sports, in my mind, you know, exceeds to say a Yale, Harvard or Ali and Frazier. And, and, and then in tennis, we've had some very special ones with Labor and Rosewall and the current big trio in Sampras and Agassi, but I, I don't think there's anything like this, you know, from 73 to 88 and playing in the majors and 14 finals and just the great contrast and styles and the way they made each other better players. That's right. Sometimes that's a cliche, right, Mary? Sometimes you hear top players saying that and I don't necessarily think they believe it, but these two did yeah. because over the course of their careers, you know, Chrissy got more comfortable coming forward and improved her volley. Martinez ground game, improved too they they really 
stretched each other to, to the hill. And, and, and the rivalry was, was just like no other one. Like no other. And the friendship that somehow came out of that locker room as well, this, the respect level. And I mean, these are two women who more than any two uh, tennis players ever, they made each other cry <laughs> more than any other two players. And, 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 over, and Mary, they overcame some tough circumstances. You remember in the middle of their career when Nancy Lieberman was such mm -hmm. a great help to Martina professionally, but she wanted Martina to, to uh, pretty much hate Chrissy, you know, yeah. and it was, uh, but they, they, they moved past that. Yeah. It, it did not linger in, in any way and because they had too much respect for each other. And I think the way that, that the friendship endured as well as the rivalry was just remarkable. Well, let me ask you this, because I totally agree with what you're saying about how they made each other better. Does that mean that Serena Williams, who really hasn't, to my mind, had a rival since Justine Enna, okay? Yeah. How much better could Serena have been if her sister or somebody else all these years was pushing her on a regular basis to greater heights? I think yeah. about that all the time. Great question. And I think you're so right to single out Justine. And I'm just so sorry that Justine didn't hang around a little yeah. longer. They could yeah. have had epic clashes. And, mm -hmm. and I think Serena had great respect for Justine as a player. I and mean, they weren't close personally, but she really respected the player. Yeah. She needed that. I, I, I will never know, but I suspect it could have driven Serena to, to even greater heights. Yeah. And, and stylistically, again, the differences between Chrissy and Martina between Pete Sampras and Andre Agassi, Bork, Macaron. The, the stylistic matchups count for a hell of a lot too. So yeah, David, they're number one on my list as well. And we will finish, and you just mentioned them. Uh, two guys that are near and dear to all of our hearts. Um, the guy was one of my idols growing up. I, I had great respect for Pete. I've said this to Steve before. But my idol growing up was Andre. Um, Why? But Why? I was not one of those. I was not one of those. Oh, I loved Andre. I hate Pete. And, and Steve and I have talked about this before. I had great, great respect for, for Pete just as a fan growing up. I was a slight Andre lean. Um, I want to throw it out to both of you. We'll start Mary, uh, Andre and Pete. Oh, well, let me ask you first. Why were you an Andre guy? Um, just, I think his personality, obviously, right. Pete was more reserved. Andre was more, uh, you know, you're growing up. I'm, I'm five years younger than Andre. So when Andre's making his move at 17, 18 years old, I'm 12, 13 years old. Yeah. Um, and every, so many people looked up to him and, and, um, it was a great rivalry to watch. Um, yes. Pete got the better of Andre in the most important matches that said they played so many, uh, great, great matches. Um, but to me, uh, again, it wasn't, uh, there, there's so many you like one, and you even see it with the Roger, Rafa, and Novak. You either like one or two of them and you hate the yeah. third. That was not the case. No, nah, no, nah, you yeah. couldn't do that with, with Andre or Pete. I, I lean more Pete, but I, I, let me tell you something. As a broadcaster, there are some players who bounced the ratings off the charts when they walked onto the court. Pete Sampras did not do that. Andre Agassi did it every time. Serena Williams does it. I mean, there are some players, Jimmy Connors, good God, especially in New York at the US Open. Um, Andre was the show. Andre was, you know, the guy, no matter who he was playing against, my eyes seemed to take me more to his side of the court than the other. It was- it Mary, was a Mary, it says, share a personal story. I had an early high school graduation present from my parents and we drove up from Chicago to Minnesota, the 1992 US Davis Cup semis where US played Sweden in the seventh, right. Stefan Eberg. Um, we had the dream team. Jim Courier played singles with Andre, and then we had Johnny Mac competed doubles. And to, to your point, Jim played the first match, and it was, you know, Friday afternoon, late afternoon, early evening. The energy's just not there. Jim guts out, five set victory. Then Andre comes in the arena, and it's like you, you said, <laughs> just the energy. It's like yeah. it was unbelievable. You feel like it's as a fan, you could run through a wall for that guy. Um, <laughs> It was just the type of energy that, that he brought into a stadium, you know, night in and night out. So, um, and, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick story, John McEnroe, you know, the long time Nike guy. And then Andre, of course, became a long time Nike guy, but Andre was a kid. He was, I guess he was still a teenager when Nike came to John and said, we want you to wear these. And John wore these shorts and he didn't like them because they showed his sweat too much. He, he never liked, he never liked any, any uh, outfits that, that showed how hard he was working, you know? 
So he said, I'm, I'm not wearing these. So Nike handed those denim shorts to Andre Agassi. <laughs> that worked out okay. That worked out okay. That worked out okay. Steve, did you know that story? Oh, I didn't know. It's a great story. <laughs> And it, and it couldn't be more fitting. I mean, they made more sense for Andre. That's right. That's they, exactly they, right. Pete, I, I when, you, when you did your book, and uh, Pete, Steve, when we're talking about Pete, when you wrote your book with Pete, you know, they're, they're obviously Andre had to come up time and time and time again. You know, there's certain things, you know, we know they had their one issue in that exhibition at Indian Wells. But outside of that, I mean, there is a mutual respect for, for one another. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I think that that was there throughout their careers and they were very, they were very, they had a very different approach to life and to the game. And, and I, I think Andre did care more about what Mary was talking about. He, he liked being the center of attention. Yeah. I don't say that critically. That's fine. He was comfortable in the spotlight. He liked that. He liked that aspect of the game. But Pete was more businesslike and it was all about winning and, and handling himself in a certain fashion. And, and, pulling off the, 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 the most important titles. So I, I, I think that there was always that contrast. It always was there, and they, they, and, but the respect was always there too. And you're right. The incident with the, you know, in Indian Wells was, was unfortunate. It was long after their careers yeah. were over. But during their careers, uh, uh, the respect was shining through at all times, even if they weren't close. This was not Everett and Navratilova. No. But on the other hand, it, 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 they, they, they understood each other on a certain level and appreciated each other's talents and capability. I think it was from an old, I end with this, uh, I think it was from a, a Sally Jenkins article in Sports Illustrated many years ago when they were at the, they were both at the height of their powers and the, and the, the height of their rivalry. Um, I, think, I think it was Pete who said it of Andre, but I'm sure they both agreed. I think Pete said, you know, if, if we had to live one night as the other, we'd kill it. We'd die. <laughs> Just the thought of Pete spending a night as Andre or Andre spending a night as Pete. Like, no, it, impossible. <laughs> and that's what made the rivalry so great. Um, Correct. Mary, Mary and Steve, for, for me to share this conversation with, with, with two Hall of Famers, truly, truly a privilege. When I rewatched the, the video, I don't think I ever stopped smiling in the <laughs> almost 50 something minutes that we did. Truly a privilege for me. Thank you both for, for sharing your experiences um, with me tonight. And uh, can't wait to, to share this with the listeners. David, I don't think I stopped smiling either. And it's, it's a pleasure talking to you. And I, I love talking to Steve Flink. He's my man. Guys, thank you so much. Mary, thanks a lot. I enjoyed it immensely. Thank you, guys.